Okay, let's get into the text. Our Sunday school teachers can go and children with them. And may God bless his word amongst you kids. Our Sunday school teachers do an amazing job. They prepare and serve and minister to young hearts, which is, which is excellent. For the remainder of us, if we've got our Bibles here, I trust you do have, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we will look at verse 15 and we'll run right through to verse 20. Or 16, sorry, verse 16 to verse 20. And I'll just read that. May we heed the word of God this morning. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, the new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. May God add his blessing to the word this morning. Last week we looked at three motivating supports that were firmly embedded in Paul's heart. And this motivation moved him to be a servant that pleased God that we read of back in verse 9 of this chapter. And as we know, Paul was being maligned, he was being mistreated, he was being spoken ill of uh, by Christians back in Corinth, and he defends himself and his, the ministry so that the believers who were maligning him back in Corinth might repent and have a change of heart, not only towards him, but towards the gospel itself. They were recalcitrant Christians, they were turning away from the gospel and turning back to a kind of a works-based religion. He also stood his ground and defended his integrity under such immense pressure. He did. It was really immense. and It took a toll on him, not only physically but psychologically. Uh, and, and he did this because he wanted to maintain his, also not only defend the gospel, but he wanted to maintain his credibility. His credibility as a model for believers to imitate, to follow. He said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, Be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. And so we asked ourselves the question, well, what motivated Paul to bother? Why did he go the distance? Why didn't he just get rid of all the hassles and just walk away from these people? Well, we learned last week from verses 11 to 15 that Paul was motivated, first of all, by a healthy fear of the Lord. He was also motivated by a heart for the church, the local church. And then he was also motivated by Christ's love for him. In other words, Christ's love controlled him. It held him on a straight course. It held him together so that he could run the race that the Lord had set before him. But as we'll find out, this motivation in Paul's life produced something else. It produced an overarching life purpose. It produced something greater, a greater reason for defending the gospel and his integrity as a servant of the Lord was produced. And that was to reach lost people for Jesus Christ with the good news of salvation. This was the overarching goal. And so powerful was this overarching goal, the apostle had already stated earlier in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, he said, For necessity is laid upon me, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. His whole life's purpose was about bringing glory to God through seeing spiritually lost people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That was his purpose. That was his goal. 
And his motivation drove him into action. Action in proclaiming the gospel. So we can ask at this point, we can ask at this point a specific question. What changed this once bigoted, prejudiced, religious Pharisee who hated Christ and his followers, what changed this man to become a man who was now controlled by the love of Christ to win lost people for Christ wherever he went and whenever he had the opportunity? What changed him to become such a man? Well, the next few verses, I believe, answer our question. Because within there, we will see that the Apostle Paul believed truth. Okay? He believed truth about what Christ had done in him. Secondly, he believed truth about the work of God in Christ throughout the whole world. He believed in God's redemptive program, what he was all about. And he also believed the truth of God's call upon the rest of his own personal life. It wasn't just the head knowledge he believed and it motivated him into action, all these things. And as we look into our text, may we learn from Paul's example this morning. May we learn to have a greater love for the unsaved, for the lost, in order to win them to Jesus Christ. And so firstly, we see that Paul believed and understood that he was a changed man. He understood that, he believed that, and he knew that. And in this next section, right through to verse 20, first of all, we will see the word therefore crop up three times. Which really shows the connectivity of this whole section. And here in verse 16, we see the first of these three. This word Paul uses, this hoste word, this therefore word, what it says is, owing to Christ's great love for, toward me, Seen in his death and his burial and his resurrection on my behalf, Paul says, I now cannot, I now will not evaluate people like I used to. I now see people differently. Therefore, owing to what has been done for me, I now see people differently. Paul had been transformed. He was a changed man. No doubt this from now on, he says here in the text, from this this from now on period, is in reference to when he was saved on Damascus Road. Remember, he, was, he was got saved. He was on the way to persecute Christians. But the Lord spoke to him. He was converted on the Damascus Road. And once he saw people, and even Jesus himself, through sin-blinded eyes, he did. He once saw people as, as mere objects that, that needed to work their way to, to, to righteousness through human effort and religious practices just like he was. His pride had him see people or any person outside of his religious and his social grouping uh, as not made it. People who haven't, haven't made it. He scorned them. He scorned them. He was a religious Jew who was deeply prejudiced. Why was this? Because he could only look or only looked at people as our text says here, according to the flesh. You see that? According to the flesh. In other words, he looked through human lenses, sin-blinded eyes. He only valued people and saw people valued on worldly standards. But this prejudiced man with so much pride and hatred towards, towards those who were Christian, he, he now looked beyond outward appearances. He now looked beyond outward appearances. You know, he, he once saw Jesus as, as, a, as a real threat to his prideful, pharisaical order. He viewed him merely as a man, a rebel who deserved to die. That's how he saw Jesus. He viewed him as a false messiah, and he hated anyone who followed him. You read that in Acts 9. Hence, his zealousness in going out and committing men to prison and no doubt to death on many occasions. But now, folks, now, 
Because of his conversion, his transformation from within, his view of people radically changed. His view and understanding of Jesus was now no longer, it says here in our text, according to the flesh. It was from a brand new heart, a brand new seat of affections. It was from a brand new understanding, an understanding of that this is what took place. That Jesus is not a mere man or a whatever, a rebel, but Jesus is Lord. That's what he understood. He'd been transformed from within. His heart toward God and toward Christ and toward people had been radically changed. He now wanted to see people as God sees them. Isn't that what you want? It must be. But is it? He now saw them as needy sinners for whom Christ died. That's how he saw people. And through his transformed heart, he was so impressed with what God had done in his own life, he wanted this same heart change to take place in the lives of sinners around him. Isn't that what you want? It should be. Now here comes the second therefore in this passage, verse 17. But please note that this therefore, it does a subtle shift A subtle shift in that it takes the emphasis off Paul's own personal experience to that of every believer's position in Christ. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement, okay? First of all, let us be very clear here. You are either in Christ or you are not. That's it, period. No middle ground. You're either saved or you're lost. You either belong to the Lord or you don't. No gray areas. And if you're still outside of Christ, your eternal destiny is in peril, folks. God's wrath is on you. Or like, the, like John says, the Apostle John says in uh, chapter 3, verse 36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So to any who are not in Christ, my appeal right at this stage of the message, my appeal to you on behalf of God is be reconciled to him. Be reconciled to him. Repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's my appeal. So what is this in Christ? Is it, you know, what is it? Uh, what does it mean? It means simply this, that a person is accepted by God. Why? Because he's now one with Christ. He's not a sinner outside of Christ. He's one with Christ. Like Paul told the the Ephesian believers, this is what he said. He said uh, that believers in Jesus Christ have been blessed with every every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And he goes on to say that we have been chosen in him. And then he further says that in him we have redemption Through his blood. In other words, a person cannot be accepted and cannot be made right with God. A person cannot be in Christ. A person cannot be saved without the Lord Jesus being central to that faith, to that belief. But in our text, we see something more that Paul understood. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creature. You see that? Or a new creation. So Paul goes on to say here that his conversion, or or any true sinner's conversion to Jesus Christ, what it does is it miraculously produces a new person. The word new here, by the way, it's not about new in substance. But I like to think about it being new in quality or new in essence. In other words, the converted sinner, he still has his old body like we still all have, and some are a bit older than others, and a bit ravaged with life and maybe even sin and and so forth. We still have that old body, but we have a brand new heart. We have a brand new heart. And because we have a brand new heart, because we've been transformed within, we naturally have now 
As those who have been transformed by the Lord, we have new desires, we have new directions, we have a new purpose for life. We have a longing to please the Lord. And folks, if you don't have that, if you haven't got any of those things, ask yourself, am I really a new creature in Christ or not? The old things, that that refers to that, that natural fleshly bent that we had that was away from God and towards self away from Christ and God, away from his righteousness, is now replaced with new things. New things like a love for God, a love for his word, a love for his people, and God's ongoing mission to sinners, to lost sinners, like we once were. This transformation begins with a heart change when we first trust the Saviour. But even as Christians, we understand and realize that that heart change, the Lord isn't finished with us yet, right? Well, yes, there's been a transformation, but the process of an ongoing heart change, it will always accompany salvation until we are bodily redeemed and taken to glory. And so if we can look back over the last year, two years, five years, and see no change where we've become more like Jesus and we love the Lord more. As a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, can I suggest you've got serious problems? It may be that you're not in a faith at all. The Lord hasn't finished with us yet. What he trans- who he transforms, he continues to work with us and to sanctify us. That's what we call that word, sanctification. In other words, yes, you may be a genuine believer, but the Lord has not finished with you yet. He keeps changing you from within. And do not think that you can make this change by yourself. You cannot transform yourself. Forget about, oh, I'll just turn over a new leaf, as we say here, to please God. That's self-righteousness. That's all about external appearances. That's external change. It only deals with the outward appearance, as verse 12 of this chapter says. It's like trying to fix up a cancerous sore with a Band-Aid. Oh, yeah, it might cover the sore up, but it only deals with the externals, right? Folks, God hates human effort that tries to fix up a spiritual problem. Heart change is what he seeks. We cannot change our hearts. Only God can. Jeremiah, the prophet, said in chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Desperately sick. Who can understand it? In other words, there's no human being who can understand the deceitfulness and the wickedness and the depravity of the human heart. We cannot. And because we cannot understand it, we cannot fix it. Only God can. Let's ask ourselves here. Do I know you know, see any fruit of a genuine heart change in our everyday lives. You can call it evaluation time if you wish. This is the evidence in my life, in your life, that I have passed through the hands, we can we say, of the Creator a second time, where we've been changed and transformed, we've been born again. All these are biblical words and expressions. Is there evidence that I'm a new creation in Christ? There should be. God wants to see it. And he only does that through heart change. And if not, God in his grace has made it so clear. If there's no change, it's quite clear. We're not in Christ. To be in Christ means that God in grace through faith has done a transforming work in you. He has changed you from within. And Paul loved this truth. He loved it and he believed it with his whole heart. And and. And he wants you to do the same. It underpinned Paul's whole ministry. It underpinned his whole love for Christ and also a love for lost people. So to be transformed, to be in Christ, also means something else, that we've been reconciled to God. So what is this? The believer's reconciliation. This is our next point. We see in verse 18, all these things are from God. 
This simply refers back to all the work of Christ spoken of in verses 14 to 17 and now includes a further descriptive term of this reconciling work of God. And sad to say, folks, sad to say, some of these biblical words that are so packed with the truth of the gospel are kind of sidestepped in much of our modern evangelism these days. And we lose out on that, we really do, if we miss them. Because some of these words contain the very heart of the gospel, and we'll be doing the Lord and the essence of the gospel grave injustice if we just skip over and and, uh, in favour of some more upbeat so-called terminology. And one of these salvation words that has fallen on hard times in our gospel presentation in our day is that of reconciliation. It's not an uncommon word, we even use it in our... Modern day. I think in Australia we have a reconciliation day, right? And we know what all that means. Sometimes in secular settings also we have terms of reconciliation that are drawn up. Maybe between two factious parties to agree on a period of peace or from then on. And this can happen, you know, in feuding families or even in the business world. And even on the battlefield, in the war room, terms of reconciliation are drawn up. But often the period of reconciliation on these kinds of circumstances and situations only provides both sides time to reload before the bullets start flying again. That's often what it is. But an understanding the need to be reconciled to God is a very different situation. Firstly, it's different in that we are to be reconciled to God. It's not that God needs to be reconciled to us. You got that? And this is important because God has done no wrong. God has done no wrong. He is perfect. He is holy. He is just. He is God. In other words, because we are all guilty and every single person is guilty of violating God's law and we all deserve eternal banishment from God's presence. And hence the unrepentant sinner is in deep trouble, folks. Really is deep trouble. He has sinned. He has missed the mark. He has violated God's law. He's put himself outside God's framework. He's at odds with him. He's out of sorts with God's perfect standard. And this makes the unbelieving sinner an enemy of God. You didn't know that? Well, you should do. Scripture tells us this, that we're enemies of God. Romans 8 verse 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. That's the... The lot, that's the position of every person who, hasn't, who is, out of, is still outside of Christ. They are at enmity with God. Colossians 1.21 says, And you who were once alienated, he's talking to our believers who, before they became believers, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. But what does happen to those who are reconciled? To those who were once his enemies? This is what happens, we're now made as friends. We're reconciled to God. Romans 5 verse 10 says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So please note that it is God here that does the reconciling. Our text states, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself. Let's stop right there for a minute. The majority of religions and Belief systems in our world completely miss out this vital truth. They sidestep it big time, pridefully and purposely, I might say. They try to override this truth. Mankind goes all out because of his bent away from God and because they believe that whatever is to be, we determine our own destinies, etc., etc. Mankind goes all out to cut his own deal to win God's favor. That's if they're religious. I don't care what religion is, whether it's Christianity or whether it's Catholicism or whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever. Man goes all out to cut his own deal with God or gods. 
against what God says. But God says that our own righteousness, you know what he says? Our own righteousness, in other words, our own works, all those good things that we do, and they may be good in the world standards, in trying to win God's favor, they are repulsive to him. It says that in Isaiah 64, verse 6. Your righteousness are as filthy rags in my sight. That's what he says. But God says here that we're reconciled by him alone through Jesus Christ alone. This is what a text states. It's, easy to, it's clear. It's easy to understand. God reconciles sinners who accept his terms of reconciliation. Did you hear that? The terms being that we believe and trust in God's gift of his beloved son who died on the cross as full payment for all our sin. That's the deal. No added input from us. It's not the gospel plus what you can do. Man cannot set the terms of reconciliation. He must either accept or reject the gracious terms laid down through the death of Christ for man's sin. That's what he must accept or reject. The Apostle Paul, he understood and he embraced these terms like nothing else. It was not about what he himself could accomplish as a good human being. He was reconciled because in humble, trusting belief, he accepted the terms and the provision provided by God in Christ. He could have foisted up some good stuff, by the way. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. He'd kept the law. He'd done this. He'd done that. It reminds me of the words of Jesus. Except, except, that we, if we, except we exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. We, uh, I've forgotten that verse. Someone quote it for me. And uh, in the. Let me look at it. It's Matthew chapter 7. Part of the Sermon on the Mount. No one could help me here. I can't believe that. Except your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There you are. I did remember it. And the Pharisees were good dudes. Man, they would pray, they would read the scriptures, they knew it off by heart, they would do this, they would do that. But the Lord hates self-righteousness. The Lord hates self-righteousness. Have you been reconciled to God? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Because you need and must accept God's terms. You need to embrace them by faith. Or remain an enemy of God and bear in a future day the full force of God's holy wrath. That's the deal. But following Paul's model, we see that God also gives him more than just reconciliation. He gives him a ministry to engage in. This is the ministry of reconciliation. We see this at the end of verse 18 and 19. And it says this. And what, you know, what is the ministry of reconciliation that was given to Paul? 19 explains what it is. That is, it says, In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. In other words, Paul, Paul's ministry was to tell of God's work and means of reconciling sinners in and through Jesus Christ. That's what he was to do. Who to? To the Jews only? No. To anyone, anywhere in the whole world. In other words, this is the Great Commission restated here. That's what it is. The ministry of reconciliation was a good news that when a sinner accepts and submits to God's terms, he in turn, that is God, in turn would wipe away the guilty sinner's sins forever. They're never to be held up against him as far as the east is from the west. I think that term was referred to in prayer this morning. And he is reconciled. No longer an enemy, but made a friend forever. Now, Paul, that's, folks, that's, that's what Paul accepted and loved and that's what completely overwhelmed him. Uh, this wonderful truth of being reconciled, it so fired him up, it really did. He valued the privilege of being God's friend so much that he would never and not at all shirk this ministry responsibility that was given to him. 
He would die trying. He would die serving in that way. And he did, by the way. My dear people, every reconciled person, God has committed what? This is what he's committed to them. End of verse 19. The word of reconciliation. It's not only, the, not only the ministry of reconciliation, it's the word. The word here is the word logos. And all it does, and what it does, I should say, what it does, it clarifies what reconciliation is. So the word logos here is just more than uh, a mere story or more than a word about it, but behind it is the whole truth of God concerning the way of salvation by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. That's what it is. And every single one of us who have been reconciled to God, who are in Christ, have this ministry committed to them. God has given us this, folks. What is our response to that ministry charge? Are we willing and zealous and fired up like Paul was to take up this new divine posting? Because that's exactly what it was, a new posting. Paul's old posting, the way of the flesh, was to kill Christians and put them in prison and to follow everything according to the flesh. But now he had a new posting. He was an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And, and this, is the, this is the believer, every believer's true born-again believer's divine posting. And we see this in the last few verses that I read. And, and I love how Paul describes this ministry. Is that of an ambassador? Now, we know what an ambassador is. It's a very common term. In our day and age, it's usually a politician or, in Australia's case, a prime minister that had a six-month posting and he's kicked out or overrun or whatever, and he's usually given a posting like an ambassador over in America or something. That's kind of how it is. It's like a second-rate political job so that he can retire, I suppose, with some kind of dignity. But anyway, uh, we know what an ambassador is, and, and, and one of the things that we do know, we need to know that he or she is expected by their country of origin never to speak in their own name, never to act on their own authority, and never to declare their own opinion on matters of state, etc., etc. What an ambassador is, is they are to represent or to be a mouthpiece of their own country. We understand that. And so Paul picks up on this representation metaf metaphorically when he says, this is what he says, our ministry is for Christ. You got that? For Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. We beg of you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. It sure is the work of an ambassador, right? And because believers are reconciled to God, our new posting, our new posting is to be ambassadors for Christ. Because what God is doing through us, he says, we beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You know, we're ambassadors for Christ. Secondary, thirdly, you're ambassadors for this church, but primarily you're not ambassadors for this church. You're not ambassadors for me. You're not ambassadors for a denomination. You're not ambassadors for any uh, parrot church group. You're ambassadors for Christ. You're his mouthpiece. That makes it pretty serious. We have to represent God whose mission in this world is to reconcile sinners to himself through the gospel. And we cannot and dare not, like sad to say many professing Christians do today, act on their own authority. Oh, I want to start up a new ministry. Oh, this church won't accept my terms, so I'll do something else. And so on their own authority, and they get themselves, and we have so many cults and horrible groups around and men who would in it for money acting on an authority we dare not speak our own opinions as truth I wonder if we really grasp this responsibility as Paul did I wonder if we really grasp the weightiness of this matter I wonder if we really do you see folks God is making his appeal hear that? a powerful word God is making his appeal to sinners through us get a load of that understand that through us. We are his mouthpiece. We are God's lips, if you want to put it that way. And then Paul kind of puts a challenge out in another passage of Scripture that he writes in Romans 10. And he asks 
rhetorically this question like he does so much in the, in, the, in the book of Romans. How will they believe, that's in the Lord, how will they believe whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Because, and I insert that because, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We are the mouthpiece of God. We are God's ambassadors. So are we as his ambassadors doing the job with integrity and taking this divine posting seriously? You know how easy it is to get caught up in the peripheral stuff. It's so easy. And we can then even go and justify all this peripheral stuff by tagging it with a go- by a name, a gospel work or whatever. Sorry to burst your bubbles here. Maybe I'm not, but... You know, it's not our primary job to save the world. It's not our primary job to eradicate starvation. It's not our primary job to eliminate homelessness. It's not our job, primary job to be Mother Teresa to millions around the world. As helpful and humanitarian as some of those things may be, our divine postings, folks, our divine posting is to be ambassadors for Christ. You got that? To appeal on God's behalf, for sinners to be reconciled to him through faith in Christ. That is pure gospel work, folks. We all need to step up on the plate on this. I honestly do. We need to step up on the plate. We call ourselves a gospel-centered church. Are we gospel-centered people? We need to be. It's not about pouncing on the enemy either, by the way. It's not about protesting at the abortion clinic. It's not about railing or venting our frustration against same-sex marriage supporters or homosexuality. It's not about that. That's not what we're called to do. It's not our duty to judge and clean up the evil in their world. That's God's business, so you leave that to him, okay? We're ambassadors for Christ. To be his mouthpiece to lost sinners. I have a book in my library many, many years old now, written by John MacArthur, one of his first ones. And it's called Gospel According to Jesus. And I'll quote something from him that I believe is very right, very correct. God does not call, and I quote here, God does not call his people to a ministry of acquisition. Now is not the time to rip out the tears. Our mission is not a political or a military crusade, and this is not the time of judgment where we are called to distribute retribution. We are sent out, rather, to be ambassadors for Christ, emissaries of his mercy and grace, end quote. My dear people, may we all know the transforming work of God that brings about faith in Jesus Christ through faith in him. May we know what it is to embrace God's reconciling work through Christ, whereby once we were his enemies, but now we're his friends. May we embrace that. And let us be so enamored, like the Apostle Paul was. Let us be so enamored with God's grace toward us that we take our divine posting as ambassadors for Christ seriously to heart for his name's sake. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father... What a weighty responsibility that you have given us. We really feel the burden of being your ambassadors. And as we go through this week and enter this new week, Lord, we will come upon opportunities to be truly ambassadors and to tell others of Jesus Christ, the only way of salvation. Father, may it not come upon us to minister out of constraint or because we have to. But may we so control by the love of Christ and all that you have done for us that we cannot help but be your true ambassador. Help us in this, we pray. In the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.